Okay, we're live and recording. Hello, everybody. Give me just a second. Uh, we have a slide on today. So uh, we're all learning here as we go again with technology. Uh, thank you, everybody who is joining us out there live. Um, this is Shannon with the Albuquerque Hispano Chamber in partnership with Square Inc. Our partners and our friends at Square in the Bay Area, <clears throat> Ms. Aaron and Mr. Ahmed, we appreciate you guys and all of your support of small business here with the Albuquerque Hispano Chamber of Commerce <clears throat> and our local small businesses as part of our Hispano Helps um, series. It's a 15 part webinar series started last week. We'll go through the end of next week and every day at noon, we're bringing you a new topic, something that you've asked for. And how do we know that you've asked for it? because over the last couple of weeks we have been reaching out with a survey a survey that is vitally important i like to say five questions five minutes if that tops on this survey that really allows us to help you guys um, and kind of navigate what are some of the things you need to learn about whether it's how to get the loans where to get the loans ppp unemployment taxes um, hr stuff um, business uh, succession plans business opening business like there's so many different topics so we're excited to talk to you about that uh, so if you have not yet done the uh, survey we would really appreciate your help with that you can go to our uh, website which is www.ahcnm.org it's right on the front page you can also click on our COVID-19 link, which is right at the top of our page, and that has all of our resources that we're working with. And it also has a page called Small Business Resource Webinar Series. And that series actually has all of our um, videos from last week. So if you missed any of those videos or you need to watch them at a slower pace or be able to write things down, click into that and you can re-watch any of those you want. And today's is also being recorded. So shortly after we're done today, this will also be uploaded. So speaking of today, we're super excited. We are uh, getting uh, joined by a big friend of the chamber here, also a, a Herencia founder here with the chamber, uh, Professor Sam Leal Fuad, who is joining us to share with us about leading our businesses and our small businesses to success during and after COVID-19. So uh, Professor Fuad, if you could take it away, introduce yourself and let's get started. Great, thanks Shannon. Uh, nice to see you and good afternoon to everybody in Albuquerque and throughout New Mexico and the Southwest region. The Hispano Chamber supports uh, so many businesses and I'm so proud to be associated. And I'd like to add Shannon's thanks to Square and New Mexico Tech as sponsors. Uh, Liam, if I can ask you to roll to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the agenda. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is managing and leading in a crisis, winning market share in a crisis, and customers, employees in a new market paradigm, as those are really the journey we're all on. Uh, my background, as Shannon said, I'm currently a professor at a uh, university uh, in Brazil, the uh, Brazilian School of uh, Public and Private Administration, known as IBAPI, for those of you who are familiar with Portuguese uh, pronunciation, uh, and also proud to be associated for a number of years with the University of New Mexico School of Management in Albuquerque, where I, I do spend also at least one semester a year uh, whenever I can. Um, my background before that was as an executive at EY, formerly known as Ernst & Young, and I led many large businesses of EY globally and in Latin America, and I also was the HR director. And so my experience on crises management comes from personal executive experience, um, as well as the academic work I've done. And I want to share that with you, but also in a way that is hopefully responsive to the needs of, of your businesses, because there are lessons we can learn from global experiences and large businesses that are relevant for small business. But I realize for many of you, those will seem very abstract, but let's hope that they're useful. And I really encourage you uh, to pass questions along through the Facebook mechanism, and those will reach me through the um, Albuquerque Hispano team. Uh, the reason for the you there is that uh, when we start to talk about managing in crisis, the first thing is to say not all crises are created equal. And when you view the trajectory of a downturn, it's usually seen as something that if it's short uh, and doesn't last a little short in terms of depth and duration, it's a strong V, uh, quick down, quick up. 
a U says maybe it's a longer slide down, a longer trough at the bottom, and a longer return. So whether this is the inversion of, of flattening the curve of the global pandemic or the trajectory of a downturn, not all downturns and crises are created equal. And what we know about COVID-19 is that it certainly has been a rapid downturn and the upturn is much more uncertain and the duration is much more uncertain. So the trajectory of that return is likely not even U-shaped. So that's what I wanna flag and let's move if we can uh, Liam, to the next slide, because really what I'd like to talk about is three areas, um, and uh, uh, this is a bit of a roadmap for discussion, and it's not, there will be no exam, that's good to know from a professor, uh, but really it's to, it's to prompt um, the issues that I think we need to be cognizant of and invite you again to submit uh, questions uh, or observations to share. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is managing and leading in a crisis. And, and, and I think it's very important to distinguish between managing and leading as really two different activities that you will engage in as business leaders or team members of business leadership groups. And the first is that when you look at managing, responding to a crisis, whether that crisis is externally generated, which is the case of COVID-19, or even when you have an internal crisis, something's happened in your business that's drawing attention publicly to you as being challenged. The first uh, order of business is really to manage, and, and that's different from leading, and let me talk about why. In managing, the first thing is really secure the safety of your people, the safety of your operations, whether it's a digital challenge or here we have a pandemic that's affecting everything we're doing in our personal and professional lives. The next is assess how does this impact our revenue and our costs. For most of us, revenue has gone to nearly zero. And, and the costs are still there. And we all have in our businesses fixed and variable costs. So the first thing is to say, are we secure? How do we secure our people in our operations? Next, what is the impact? What are the trends? What are the, the expectations of revenue and costs? Normally we operate in a, in a budgeting scenario that says it's same as last year, plus or minus 5%. And let's do rosy planning and say, how could we grow five or 10? Well, all of a sudden, those, those forecasts and budgets are gone, revenues dropped, and the question is, what cost can we really manage? And that means reduce, okay? And the next step here is to communicate, 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 communicate. Talk to your people, talk to your customers about how difficult this is. If we stay in a shell and don't talk, uh, we aren't reaching out and indicating we are aware there's a challenge and we're dealing with it and how we're dealing with it. So the first check mark here, the check mark means key actions to take. The, sh the first check mark is to take short term decisions around safety, around reassessing results and communicate. Okay, let's talk about the difference now between managing and leading. Leading is really showing that you get it. That is while we're managing, we're also demonstrating that we understand the bigger context, the bigger challenge, the bigger opportunities around how we're gonna get through this together and how you personally as a leader or a leadership team are responding. Part of this gets to who is our stakeholders? Traditionally, we think about if you're a private uh, business owner, you're the owner, you're, or if you're a shareholder, you're the shareholder. Well, we'll look a little bit more and say, we now think about stakeholders much more broadly, not just our owners, but also our employees, also the communities in which we operate, our customers, our regulators, and others. So the notion of, are we identifying who's relevant, prioritizing, you can't deal with everybody, and engaging our stakeholders. The next point is super relevant, and that is leadership generally is very important, but it's different. It's different based on your style based on the style and the personalities of your team. So knowing what your style is, some of us are very operational to begin with. Some of us are much more big, big thinkers. So knowing your style, knowing the interaction of your style with others is really important. And, and that means there's not one size fits all in terms of leadership. And here the check mark is, create a balance of communicating urgency. If you, put, if you deny this is a crisis that needs to be managed and led, that's not authentic, it's not credible, but balance that sense of urgency that is compatible with your style with the notion that we're as con under control, we're approaching this as calmly as we can, 
okay? So that's first around some comments on managing and leading in a crisis. I'm happy with questions to share personal experiences around this, but what I wanted to do, first of all, is lay out this con these concepts um, around these three buckets of how do we manage during and emerge from this crisis successfully. So let me stop there. So that's really the first pillar I wanted to share and see, Shannon, if there's any questions or comments from the group or from you and the others in the chamber at this time. Yeah, so Sam, uh, one of the questions um, that I have is, can you, you know, because what we're talking about today and, and what we're learning about today is not just uh, around COVID. So maybe in your experience and, and what you teach and what you've studied in the past, what are some examples of other crises that can really put a business on hold or, you know, stop it dead in its track? So I, I would love for everybody to know that this is not the takeaway for just COVID. This is how we can use to manage during crisis. So what are some of those crises? Good, and that's relevant. So while we're acknowledging this is bigger than any crisis any of us have lived through, I'm, I'm only 60 years old, so, uh, you know, I don't even remember World War II. Uh, but, what, but, but so we do know this is bigger than anything we've seen since the Great Depression in terms of that, and that, that, is, that is a holy cow moment, right? But you're right, that is, the lessons we learn in crises can apply to shorter downturns, like we saw the 2008-2009 downturn that we refer to as the financial crisis, or you go back to Y2K, and that was not quite as big as was expected, okay? For those of us who are Latinos, so, so many of us are in New Mexico, we are the nation's uh, only majority Latin uh, society. Um, we know that there were crises in Latin America that were financial, that weren't necessarily global crises. So there are examples of macro or external environments that can impact us. Um, also certain as we're going to go to the next uh, topic around industry, some industries get impacted by crises, whether it's oil prices could impact a very important industry in our state or, or others. So, so external crises come in many different shapes and forms. As you also pointed to, and I mentioned earlier, they're not all external. So what's an example of an internal crisis? Okay, well, um, we had a IT glitch and somebody hacked into our system and stole the email addresses of all our clients, okay? Uh, so there are security issues. There are, there, whether they're IT, whether they're personal security, we had a tragedy occur, you know, so there are many forms of crises. And so you need to be prepared to uh, manage and lead in different types of crises and knowing one size doesn't fit all in terms of crises or uh, what's the best approach to managing or leading. Yeah, we've had, um, you know, I, I know of some some examples. Sometimes crisis can be small and, and uh, really centered and focused on one business. Maybe they've lost their leader or their president. How do they overcome that stuff? Uh, sometimes you lose uh, many employees due to a layoff, which is what we're kind of doing uh, through some of the businesses now. But these can happen outside of COVID. So I just want to make sure that the listening audience is, is understanding this is not just about what's happening in today's world. Take this when you have something that happens inside your small business and take these examples and break these out into what works for your business. But, you know, noticing that short term decisions and communication is absolutely huge and also finding the balance of, of urgency and learning how to keep calm and that calm control. So, again, just for everything. So, Sam, take us to the next step. Thank you, Shannon. So this is very important because we're saying, look, we want to be relevant and focused on the, the scale of this pandemic, but also give you some tools that help you think through this. But also, as Shannon's pointing out, Riley, this is applicable to any crisis. OK, so let's move to that middle pillar, which is really about winning market share in a crisis. And this seems a bit counterintuitive because we don't we all think about we're all struggling. We're all coping. Isn't everybody underwater? Well, to some degree, yes. But look at the bottom. The bottom says market disruption will yield winners, the winners who manage, who lead, and who reinvent. And so really winning market share in a crisis is an imperative. It is an opportunity even in a crisis. And we don't think about things that way. So what I wanted to do was say to you, okay, while we have to be focused on the nature of the challenge, we have to show strong leadership, it's also a time to be strategic about how do we not only get through this, but emerge stronger. What are the things we do in managing in the short term that position us to be the winners afterwards, okay? And when you think about winning, I wanna just share a little bit on what we know about business strategy. And this is a little bit of how academics will present these issues, but I also wanna share, this comes from my own 
practical experience. And again, I welcome those of you participating virtually to share your, your observations or questions in this. So the first thing is to think about what market are we in? This is about winning in a market. And markets get defined by industry and industry gets cut into all kinds of slices, sector, subsector. And really what you're getting at is, what is my business in terms of which industry am I in? Which geography do I play in? And I am all of Albuquerque, am I northern New Mexico, am I Bernalillo County? You know, am I, am I on Central Avenue? What's my scope? Do I aspire or, you know, what is my current footprint and who are my competitors? My current competitors that I always know and think about, but also who are potential competitors? The, the academic literature would say, who could come at my business as right now a supplier, right now a customer, right now somebody in a slightly different industry who could decide they want to move into my space. So this is to say, it's almost a Venn diagram of what do I consider my industries? What's my geographic footprint? Who are my current competitors? How could that all change? So that's a little bit of what's the playing field, okay? And the next thing says, how do you uh, develop a strategy? And what we know now is that strategies um, are, again, not just focused on owners um, and potential investors, but are more broadly seen as impacting a broader range of stakeholders beyond owners and investors. You don't have to be a public company to be interested in your current owners and potential investors. Like maybe you have an opportunity to have additional investors join you uh, as private investors or venture capital, etc. So the notion of stakeholders is not just owners and investors. It's our employees. It's our customers. It's the city of Albuquerque who provide the infrastructure economically and socially and have a vested interest. In it. So this notion of stakeholders and how do we measure success has gotten beyond just sales growth and just profitability. We may look at a number of other factors. We may care about our carbon footprint print. We may care about our employee satisfaction. We may care about uh, the level of community support we can attract. So what we've learned in business um, academic work is that thinking more broadly about stakeholders is really what's sustainable business and can help you create competitive advantages in ways we didn't used to think about. Okay. The other thing about this is there's, again, an external view of this that says businesses exist in an institution. An institution is the regulatory and social environment of New Mexico. Again, the fact that we are in a Latino community, whether you're a Latino business or a Native American business, we, by the way, are a diverse community. So while we're very, just like the Hispano Chamber, we're very proud to represent the Hispano and Latino business community, but we're also the natural diverse chamber to support Native American business and for all businesses that want to thrive in an environment that is New Mexico that is wonderfully diverse. That's our strength. And we need to not be shy about that. We need to be proud of it. So that external view says that shapes a business's characteristics in New Mexico. The internal view says, yeah, but just look at the balance sheet, the profit and loss, look at the typical stuff you'd look at to measure return. So it's not an or, this is an and. And so the reason I say this is this work around strategies, we understand it much better academically. And there are many lessons here that I think are very good for business owners. And the last that's mentioned here is what's called the, the business model. And this term has kind of cropped up. And what this says is, look, we know we're all much more focused on our customers, on on our people, on this broader stakeholder thing. And this conversation has been, how, what's our business model? How do we go to market? We sell directly how? And how much of that do we do online? And how much is in person? And how much is business to customer or business to business, okay? So this notion of a business model is a concept that has kind of crept in and you need to be aware, even in a smaller business, how does this stuff we've learned about bigger businesses maybe help you think through this crisis. And the big check mark here is that what we know, particularly in this environment, is that COVID-19 has created a huge shift to digital relevance. That is, even if you've got curbside pickup, you, you don't even want to have to pick up the phone if you can help it. You'd like your customers to know what you have on inventory, send you a, 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 a message via email or post a note on your website and come pick up the product. So if you weren't very digital before, you're going to be much more digital now. Um, and this is the issue. Social distancing means the big, the big um, tool to use is what we're doing now. It's not just Zoom. Zoom for your customers too, right? So this notion of the acceleration of digital relevance into all 
all this is very, very important. And the last point I want to mention on this middle pillar of how do you win market share in a crisis is the notion of innovation and entrepreneurship, which so many of our, of our great chamber members are, where we welcome not only the big companies that want to be associated with the growth of all business in New Mexico and support um, smaller businesses, but so many of our members are entrepreneurs and struggling with this environment as, as personal businesses and small businesses. And remember, what we know about entrepreneurship is two things. There's two types of entrepreneurs. One type of entrepreneur invents new products that nobody thought of, and that's really cool. And those of you who can do that, bless you, because you know that's an amazing talent. But many other entrepreneurs actually invent new ways to deliver existing products. And as we just said, what COVID-19 is doing is forcing us all to think about, how did I do things before? How do I do them now to keep my people safe, to use technology more? So in a way, COVID's forcing us all to be that second type of entrepreneur. Steve Jobs and the cell phone. I used to have a cell phone this big. What Steve Jobs invented was a phone like this that I really wanted to use, right? So the notion is know how you can reinvent yourself given the market you operate in, given your strategy, given how you're going to have to innovate and know that digital is key in this pandemic. Let me stop on that second pillar, see if we have any comments or questions or Shannon, and then I still have eight minutes to try and cover the last one. <laughs> So, you know, Sam, what I want to, what I want to do is I want to do just a little quick recap. I'm really good at taking notes and there was some things that you brought up that I think are real important to um, the listening um, audience. And one of the biggest things that I, that I took away is the innovation part of it, because at the very bottom of this, of this uh, slide, it specifically says, uh, disruption will yield, yield winners if you just pull that little piece out. And uh, the creativity behind all of the innovation is what's really going to keep people. So there's been some really cool things that have been going on here during this time with some of our local businesses. And I won't name them individually, but I will say we've had businesses because we're in the middle of reaching out to all of our members. We have a little over a thousand members and, and during this time we've spent the last, you know, five, six weeks or so calling and reaching out and we've gotten some really great stories. Some of them have decided to close and use this opportunity to remodel, make updates, do the stuff that they've been needing to do, but we never have time to do. And so some of the more uh, businesses that have been around a long time had better, you know, sustainability than maybe a brand new business that are able to do that. So I thought that was a really great way. They're going to do big grand reopenings and get ready to show what they have new. Um, a lot of the businesses have gone to virtual. We have spas that are doing virtual skincare classes and we have workout uh, companies that are doing virtual online classes and curbside pickup for your products with them. Um, and that's that's because they're learning their market and they're also learning their industry and their competitors and they're all working together. So I think that that's important. And then we also have to look at the markets that have not been affected as much as others and what are they doing during this time. So construction, real estate, insurance, delivery services, um, you know, cleaning companies, if anything, they've gotten busier. If anything, they've been busier. And so we're still learning from them as well. Some of the new things that they're doing because they're taking the time to learn the technology and all of that as well. So again, really loving that statement of um, disruption will yield winners. That's huge. And I think we should walk away with that for sure. Oh, Shannon, that's great. And this is why, again, this banner chamber is so relevant, not only in general, but in the survey, which actually seeks best practices and hard lessons that are being learned. And, you, and it's, it's great because we're really talking about what our members are experiencing and they're examples of this. So as you just said, industries have a different experience. Um, you know, Zoom, we're on Zoom. Zoom's doing just great, I think. We all know that. Facebook's doing very well in terms of activity moving to online. So gaming industry is very important. Video games are built a lot in, in New Mexico as they should be given our capabilities in the arts and technology. So there are sectors that are winners. There are others less impacted, as you said, construction and less, especially commercial construction where people can work socially distant. So there are industries that are less impacted, even winners. So there, and, and as you said, I'm sorry, go ahead. And I think that's what's important is the fact that social distancing is going to continue after this. You know, it's going to take a while to get back to what we knew as normal if we ever go back to what we knew as normal. And so having that ability to be creative and innovative in your industry and figure out how can I reopen but, you know, still maintain the social distancing. So again, just really, really thinking about yielding what happens about yielding winners and disrupting a little bit and and maybe this was a good thing sam in the sense that we're all rethinking how we work 
Look, I'm old enough to remember the 1960s. There was a great advertisement by the uh, National Association uh, of the Advancement of Colored People, and it said, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And so, yes, there's business opportunity in this environment. And rather than to go into those, what you've said is, and we promised in the, in the survey, I know from the Albuquerque Chamber, to share the results of the survey anonymously. It says, here are some of the best practices, examples of what people are doing. So I think everyone should look forward to those because what you said is, those examples show this framework that we've described in the middle. That is, look at your industry. If you, when you reinvent, um, how do you come back out knowing the market will be different because of social distancing, because of the relevance of digital? How do you rethink your footprint of industry, geography, competitors? What's your business model? How are you innovating uh, of necessity and of opportunity? So in the interest of time, let's move to that third pillar, which is really around, look, what we know about business strategy today is that no matter all the great things that businesses do, uh, the businesses that are most successful of all sizes focus intensely on two things. And this is not a typo. There's, these are both number one. Uh, and that is intense focus on your customers and not just who bought what and were they happy, but do we really listen to their needs? Do we think about the customer experience? Think about it in a social distancing for those of you in retail. And all of a sudden you can only have so many customers come into the store. The way they stand outside, the way they come in, that whole experience of being a customer under COVID-19 where you're managing that, you, we all have different experiences. So if you do that in a way that you have a good experience during this difficult moment, that's gonna shape your impression. So little things matter in terms of the customer experience. Or as you said, those of us who've closed to regroup and rebrand, wow. You know, how are we doing that thinking about the new customer experience? The next deep focus is around relationships. A lot of business had gone into sales and they were saying, they look at pipeline, they look at, um, you know, sales and profits. Well, customer relationship management has become a much bigger um, exercise in terms of, um, you know, really knowing how customers are looking to buy, what are their key um, decision points, how do I be responsive, how do I develop a long-term relationship, so how do I measure that, how do I get feedback, you know, and feedback is so important in so many ways, not just you know, do I have a warranty or did I have a complaint? But, and you also have to be careful not to overwhelm people. We're all overwhelmed with too many COVID-19 messages. So customer focus, intense customer focus and customer experience is, is where all businesses and big businesses have gotten around this in bigger ways and, and small businesses know this. But what's important here is you can learn from how big businesses are intensely focused on this. And many of the tools and approaches can be, um, uh, mimicked by smaller businesses using apps and small technologies. So you don't need big systems. You may not yet be the size for Salesforce, but many of the things Salesforce does great for bigger businesses can be done by small businesses on their own is the first point. The second point is intense focus on our employees. We just got done saying the safety of our people. We've got to demonstrate how we cared about that. We've got to be providing them the protection they need. And workforce planning has become not just something of, oh boy, who can, how do we all share the pain? What I put there at the bottom is there are many workforce management best practices. Um, it is about communication. It's about saying we're all in this together. Um, we may not be able to keep all of our employees full time, full pay. Um, okay, but are we keeping all of our employees and with less pay? That's kind of a furlough system. Remember, most of your rewards involve fixed compensation, variable compensation, and benefits. Well, maybe we don't all just take a haircut in terms of compensation, but maybe we say we can't afford variable compensation. There are some benefits we can't do, gym memberships, et cetera, but we're, these are how we're keeping the lights on to go back to the revenue and cost assessment. And frankly, we will have people, most businesses at their healthiest times, best practices would say, a few percentage points of the people in any business, even in a growth mode, their best opportunity for their career might be elsewhere. And so how do we evaluate employees? How do we think about really who's, who's a long-term employee in our business and who might be better elsewhere? How do we help them make a transition to somewhere else without sort of it being a conversation around just downsizing? Okay, so workforce and, the, and I want to be careful because I don't want to use happy talk and have people say, well, those are euphemisms for firing people. No, I mean, you know, the issue here is, is different. <laughs> let me let you uh, chime in. Or were you just clearing uh, your throat? Uh, yeah, I was clearing my throat. I um, <clears> am <throat> allergy season <laughs> on top of everything.
looking out, Sam. I'm looking <laughs> and say around here. My goodness. Um, you know, one thing that I really loved uh, that you were talking about um, under your first number one is the um, experience. And what we've noticed uh, with some of our members and just being out in the community here in Albuquerque, there's been some really unique experiences. There's essentials that have to be open, whether they're grocery stores or what have you. But I mean, there's been talk of people, you know, streaming music and, you know, just different ways to keep people engaged and keep them calm and keep the stress down because it is it's stressful when you have to wait in line for essentials whether those be paper towels or wipes or whatever it is that you need so i think that that's important the experience and going back to being creative and i also love what you said um and I, I might have rolled it all into one but you know preparing your business or your organization ahead so you know today making those tough decisions about cuts or cut backs so that everybody can come back to work when time is ready to a, to a sustainable organization. That's important. And being able to share that and get it across to your employees is huge. And I know that I've talked to a lot of business owners and say, I don't know how to how do I help them to understand that yes, I have to cut back now and they can go on unemployment now, but by doing that, we can come back to an organization where I didn't drain everything and I have no way to pay them when we get back. So those are huge right now. Thank you, Shannon. That also, thank you. It helps us move towards the finish line here and tie together really the first point and the last, because as you said, look, when we look at developing people, usually when I teach HR classes in Brazil or at UNM and I get to the section on workforce planning, it's the most uninteresting section of the course, except in a downturn. Okay. So then all of a sudden I've got to put all this material. We have a big robust discussion. So it becomes very important. And as you just said, normally you're worried about people's development, what experiences can they change jobs? So they grow, they learn more, they contribute more. And are they engaged? Are they satisfied? Are we listening to them? When you tie the first point together around how do we manage? What are the tough decisions? Let's communicate those with, and we're thinking about the future and how we're going to win afterwards. And here's how we look different. Here's how the market looks different. And these are the types of people we're going to need to be together to be successful. You're really nicely connecting that first point of while you're managing, part of your leading is to be thinking ahead and communicating not only what we're doing that's tough, but what are we doing that's going to help us as we move successfully into this new paradigm. And that's really why that last check is to think about workforce management best practices and that go well beyond managing in a crisis, but really think about what's the workforce we need for the future, what's the environment, and how do we emerge as a winner, whether our industry was greatly disrupted, somewhat disrupted, or significantly disrupted. And so let me stop there and make sure if we can, Liam, we'll go to the, Liam, we'll go to the next slide, which is, again, just to thank, uh, for me, it's always a pleasure to work with you. Shannon and the Hispano Chamber. I'm so proud to be associated with all that we do, the, the little chamber that does big things. Um, and thanks also to Square and to New Mexico Tech. Uh, those are Shannon's and my closing observations. Um, uh, if there are any questions, please pass those along. And maybe in the meantime, Shannon, just let everybody know the upcoming webinar schedule. Yeah, so, you know, we like I said, we have about, after today, we have nine days left. Tomorrow, we're going to be tackling um, a little bit of HR and, and some stuff that you need to know within your organization uh, right now during COVID about HR practices, uh, things that are going to be important for you and your employees. So definitely stay tuned and tune in for that tomorrow. But I want to say, you know, thank you to Sam for joining us. Uh, Sam, we appreciate you. I know that you're coming to us remotely. Um, we miss you in New Mexico, and we're excited to have you back soon. Um, hopefully we'll be celebrating our 45th anniversary this year with the Albuquerque Espano Chamber. And as, as, uh, as the situation permits, as the community permits, we hope to be celebrating uh, with you and the community. So uh, Sam is right. If you guys would like to reach out, uh, Sam has a lot of uh, great ideas and a lot of great ways to help businesses grow. Please feel free to reach out to us here at the Chamber. You can reach me at Shannon at ahcnm.org. Uh, you can also reach Ernie or Jim at that exact same address, ahcnm.org. And we'll be happy to uh, get any questions and get you in connection uh, with Sam to do so. 
So again, Sam, we wanna say thank you for taking the time out of your day. I know that you're busy uh, preparing uh, for everything that's upcoming with small business. And we hope to see you soon on, a, on another venture. Uh, your expertise is always so appreciated in the community. And uh, we thank you as always being a partner here at the Albuquerque Esparto Chamber. And again, thank you to Square and our friends behind the technology at New Mexico Tech. We appreciate you guys. Everybody have a great day, and we will see you guys tomorrow, same time, same place. Thanks. See you soon. Bye-bye.